hello, hello, hello. Today is an exciting day. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um, I am starting a um, kind of new series. Hopefully it will be successful. Hopefully this is uh, one start of many. Um, but we will see where we get to. This is going to be kind of interviewing interesting New Zealanders in a bike scene. Guys who build bikes, guys who ride bikes, guys who've been riding bikes since 50s, 60s and still ride bikes. Um, Hopefully, uh, it'll go. I know that Kiwis are generally shy, uh, but hopefully um, it'll take over and we can do some cool stuff. Um, today, I am meeting uh, a gentleman called Mike. He is a pretty cool individual. I met him as my client for tattoo. And uh, obviously, he just say motorcycles and we just talk all damn day. So, um, yeah, this is my first adventuring into the interviewing process. It might be pretty crap, but, you know, hold on and bear with me. Hopefully I'll make it somewhat interesting. As you can see, I'm fully wrapped up. It was some eight degrees Celsius in um, Pedestan where I came out of. I was misty and cloudy and horrible. And as soon as we got up the hill, uh, I just cleared up. And uh, on this side, look at the sky. Holy shit, beautiful. So um, I need to find uh, Mike's address and um, let's start this interview. Um, let's do it. So we are in the not a motorcycle shop, this, which is full of motorcycles. And this is um, Mike's kingdom. And this is Mike. How are you, Mario? I'm very good. Awesome, yeah? And look at this. Man, this is amazing. Uh, my great store is uh, Indian. That's 1920, eh? No, 1941. 1941. Was a, a military bike originally, made for World War II. Um, but I don't think many people restore them and keep them military. They generally civilianize them. Uh, yeah. And he is a proper expert on these scooter machines. And um, he built this uh, beautiful thing and been racing it. I saw the videos. It was so damn cool. Uh, 
This is uh, my dream. One day I'll I'll be like him and I'll have a <laughs> workshop like him. <laughs> It'll be a fucking nightmare sometimes, man. <laughs> right. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask is um, how did you get into this? How did you start? When did you find the love for two wheels? Oh, I was a kid. So I was brought up on a farm and um, we had a farm bike and that was like, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. Your friends were miles and miles away. So in the morning you got up with nothing to do, hop on the bike and just ride around and have fun with it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then as a teenager, I bought my first bike, which was an old BSA Bantam. And it came in boxes of parts. Oh, God. <clears throat> and so I had it in the shed and I had the Haynes manual and a set of really generic tools and I put it together and then I kicked it and it went mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe it and that was I think like I got that sort of like euphoric feeling of because then you've done this you build mm -hmm. an engine and you kick it and it goes and you're just like I am God I've created life you know yes. so um, I think it's that buzz yeah. that drives me more like for me the passion of motorbikes is the building of it mm -hmm. like riding it is only a small percentage of the fun I get mm -hmm. Like, if I have a day, like say, a beautiful sunny day, I don't have any commitments, I'm in here and I'm working on them, you know, whereas other people would get up and go, this is riding weather, I'm gone, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I freaking kickstart her and I'm just, whoa, I'm so excited and freaking flames shooting out of the exhaust and then she blew up. <laughs> so, um, but my bike did the same. Oh. The BSA, first test drive, and I was so excited, got off on the road when it was going and then it was like, let's see what it can do. Boom! And it blew up. And it was like, fuck. So we ordered back to the shed. And okay. I talked, you know, because I didn't know anyone. Called someone up who was in from an engine reconditioning shop. And they said, oh, what did you gap the rings to? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And I, then I realized the piston rings have to have a certain oh, clearance. Because okay. when they heat and expand, yeah. they bind against the walls if there's not enough clearance. So every bike I've built ever since, check the clearance on the rings, it's, right. you know. Um... But they were the same thing. Wheeled it straight back in the shed, pulled it all apart again, found what I'd done wrong, put it back together and it went, you know? Um, fantastic. When did, the, when did the life for the scooters happen? Yeah. That, I think, because initially I wanted, the, the dream bike I had as a kid was a Triumph Bonneville. I wanted uh -huh. a 750 Bonneville. And um, my dad wouldn't let me get one because I'd go and kill myself. <gasps> um, so I got the BSA, it was mm -hmm. just a little bike, and then... It was a scooter that was at my granddad's house lying against, you know, um, under this sort of an eave of a shed. It was called an NSU Prima, mm -hmm. built in Germany. And Simon got that home, pulled it apart, put it together, and it went. Mm -hmm. Simon was like, oh my God, I love this. And then I met this community of people who were all scooter heads. Mm -hmm. And next and the next one fell at me. So the green bike there, that's the second bike I ever the second best bike I ever got. And I bought that off the original owner in Palmerston North, who's still a family friend. Um, and same thing, pulled it apart, made it go, made it go faster. And the, ever since then, I've, probably since 17, 18, I've always had a project. Uh -huh. The funny thing was, like, we were talking, so we met through Tattoo, yeah. and we had two days where we just sat and talked to each other, and it was amazing, we talked bikes, like, completely unfiltered, you know, because you don't get an opportunity to do that often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the questions you asked me was, what's the ultimate bike? Money's not an object. Mm, yeah, yeah. That's it. And the reason is because it's a bike I built, and it's something that I'd wanted. I'd wanted an Indian since I was a teenager. And I finally got one, and I bought it with my own money, and I built it up myself. Yeah. That's it. That's my bike. And the funny thing was, I finished that, and then I was bored. And it was like, I found myself Googling, what do middle-aged men do for hobbies? Because <laughs> all I did was build bikes, yeah. you know. Um, Fishing. Then, <laughs> can you imagine? Golf is the most pointless fucking exercise in the world, chasing a little white ball around a field. Unbelievable. Um, so, and then this project turned up, um, and like this is so. This was the five hundred dollar Indian. This came up on Trade Me, and it wasn't advertised as an Indian. It was sort of advertised as garden art. Um, 
and and the thing about it is it's it's exercising every one of my um, machining skills mm. to actually try and put this thing back together, you know. And also the networks of people that you you find. So you go around and see such and such. And I showed you earlier, like um, this spent years living under a hedge, genuinely living under a hedge, and water had got inside the cases. So I'll show you this. Can you see that? So you see how pitted that gear is because it just sat with water yeah. on it for years. And you can't run that. So um, so what you do is you call up your friend who you've known for years. So put the jug on, you go around, you sit with us and go, right, I need another one of those. Oh, you need to talk to Simon. Simon's in Nelson. Here's his number. Give him a call. And you start this whole like social networking thing. You know, yeah. from back in the days when it was um, landline, you know. Calling people up, you're, hey man, I've got your number from Trevor. He said you can help me with this, and then you spend two hours talking about bikes, and <laughs> then you go to Nelson that meeting yeah. with the guy, you know. Even even for a guy who's not from New Zealand, you know, I always feel that um, uh, if you grow up here, you kind of have a more of a chance to have connections mm. because you have a lifetime of things, and uh, the connections I have made in Slovakia, there were nobody was bikers, nobody did anything, but um, here. Even the little pe few people I know, they kind of the same thing. Call call a guy in uh, in Auckland. He's uh, they call him Ironhead Tim, and uh, yeah, yeah, he built Ironheads for the last 40, 50 years or something. And uh, I called him at ten o'clock at night when I was so panicked about the bike, and he says, "Give me a second, I'll just pop in the garage." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like at ten o'clock at night, and he goes rummage through the boxes. Holy shit, I do have it. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in the post in the morning. Yeah, just okay. That, that's cool and the thing I like about that too is that it's it's um, the only payment is the appreciation that you've got oh mm. my god you're such an amazing guy and that's all he needs yeah. hey man I'm happy to help out so I, I've, you know I used to do this kind of work um, I've only really shut this workshop in the last 18 months mm. uh, and there's still other people's bikes here that um, I'm still trying to finish up but for me the reward of that the appreciation is worth so much more yeah. than the money. And I've, the same thing, I get people call up, especially young kids, man, I've got a Vespa, I hauled it out of you know someone's shed, blah, 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 I need a carburetor. And you're just like, oh, hang on. Got a box of them over here, here man. What's your address? I'll send it to you. Oh, thanks, What is what is it worth? It's just like, fuck, just take it. Yeah. You know, if it gets you back on the road, that's awesome. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was, I found a guy online uh, with the, um, uh, Actually, carburetor, accelerator pump. There is the. I didn't even realize that one has a little ball inside, and you can hear it rattle. And the and some versions didn't have it, so I'm putting it in the ultrasonic cleaner, cleaning, cleaning. Try to loosen it up. I hear nothing, and then uh, somebody saw my video online and just yeah, yeah, I'll have one. Ship it. You know, boom, done. Yeah, so Use awesome, it. eh? Uh, yeah. One um, one question I had: When did the not a motorcycle shop? No, oh, that started, so when I very first started, I was at home with my children. Mm -hmm. um, so I had children under five, and I was caring for them most of the time, mm -hmm. and doing little bits of work. I used to come out and work in the evenings, sort of after 8pm, mm -hmm. and back when I was young, and had lots of energy. And some, one day this guy calls me up, and he's like, fuck man, I'm supposed to be on the ferry in two hours, and I've got flat on the front tyre, I'm like, can you help? And I'm just like, buddy, I'm not a motorcycle shop, I can't help you. <laughs> And I just thought that was the funniest thing. So and and so I sort of loosely called myself that. And um, when it came to actually time to register the business, and I had a business mentor. It was a friend of mine, mm -hmm. but he came around and I just said, right, so that's a pretty dumb name. What do you think? And he just went, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. That's what everyone knows you as. So so I stuck with it, and it's um, it's worked, yeah. you know. That's yeah. Cool. Do you have a um now, when this is not a shop, do you have a um, aim? Or do you want oh, to, I just want it filled with my things.
and I want it set up as a workshop and when a friend comes around and says oh man my bike's not doing this you know they'll come around in the evening bring a couple of beers and we put it up and I'll help them out and I'm really happy in that you know Um, so I was really pleased to take the money away from this work and just do it for the joy of it again Mm. yeah that's where I find the fun I'm I'm definitely happy that um at least through my work, you get to meet people like yourself. You know, it's not mm. necessarily that too real kind of world, but uh, through the tattoo, it's like a, you know, when you send the inquiry and I see your email, I'm just oh, this guy's into motorcycle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I tattooed the guy uh, two days ago, and he had um, he wanted the um, a Britain motorcycle tattooed on. Uh, oh, I saw it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful know, work. Looking, thank you. And you kind of go. That's gonna be a damn good day, you yeah. know, because you just don't shut, shut up talking about everything. And he knew more. Well, he's, it's a favorite motorcycles of the guy, and uh, he just knew so many different details. Mm. You know, I, I kind of know off the bike, and I've seen it in the museum, whatever. But he knew kind of nitty gritty things, and uh, and I got so wrapped up in it. For example, that I dreamt about for two days doing details. <laughs> And then you get so you know when you when it's something is a passion outside your work, that passion infiltrates your work. You get doubly hands down, and mm. I'm just oh doing these little. Uh, this is the brake caliper, and this has to be perfect. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And all that shit. So that's kind of cool. I love that. Yeah. See, Britain's like a hero of mine, but not for the bike. Mm. It's for the the work ethic yeah. and the vision. You know, I, I had this idea. I want to do this, yeah. and then he just did it. You know, you learn, okay, I'll learn how to cast stuff. And then, I don't know how to do this. I'll, I'm going to find the person that can and bring them in and get them to give me the information, you know. And the bike's an amazing result. Yeah. But, but the, that so was, you know, for him as well, like I say, the journey mm-hmm. for me was way more interesting than the end bike. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what uh, That's kind of a... I don't know Britain. I don't know much about him, but then... Uh, I think closest to people like him for me, it's you. you know? uh-huh. and I, oh, my God. I, I know Can you, you imagine that. No, but like, you no. know, you you know, you get some old shit and you just shove it in a lathe and you build stuff, you know. And uh, I have this is this my iron is the first thing I build, but I just put it together. I have a manufacturer, you know, I made some brackets, yeah, and I welded some shit together. But uh, when you get to the point where you can. Uh, chuck a flywheel into a lathe and you shave bits of or you clean up things up you know you was my inspiration <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind but look so most of that is is uneducated you buy the tool like we were talked earlier I bought the lathe from an engineering firm um, and you stick something in it and you spin it around and fuck I don't know what I'm doing I'll call someone yeah. you know and oh you need to do this or I'll oh, bring it around let me show you yeah. awesome you know so um, it just, it's just that matter of like having the vision yeah. and doing it. I was wondering what um, what is the I'll turn around. What is the the speed you made on this thing? Oh, on the, the race bike. Yeah, on a race bike. So we GPS it down the front straight at Tiratonga at 130, and that was pretty much about all it would do. That was top gear, just hitting. The top of the rev range mm. as you were coming into the big sweeping left hander. Right. Um, what's the size for the engine? Sorry. What's the engine size? So it's about a one ninety. It's one eight six. If we're being honest, um, it's one side of an RD three fifty Yamaha that we sort of grafted onto it. Mm. Um, but it's you know the original scooter engine cases, and then we just same thing. I had the vision. I saw the cylinders on eBay, and the cylinders are cheap. 250 bucks for two cylinders landed in New Zealand with pistons and everything to make it go. And I was just thought to myself, if I can make those cylinders fit that bike, mm-hmm. I'll never have to worry about reboring cylinders again and it should go really fast. And it took about two years, just on and off. Um, did and you, it did. Did you bore the cylinders at home? Can you put it into a lathe and then, or you just give it to people? I So the cylinders um, remain standard. Mm-hmm. That was how I um, modified the cases. So we put a new, with the cylinder bolts on, mm-hmm. we machined that off, put a lump of aluminium, welded that on, and then machined, you know, the spigot hole and the transfer ports and everything starts to match the new right. cylinder, you know. Um, but it was awesome because 
we talked about this earlier. Um, the people who were coming through the pits, the people who really dug it and really got it were the old school bikers. Mm. You know, the ones who came in and just loved that real sort of Burt Monroe style of taking something old, make it go fast, and um, and just work with what you got. Rather, than, like anyone can go out and buy something fast off the shelf, you mm. know, or from a store. Um, but this is, and this was really, really fun. And this was, the event was about two months out. And it was like, fuck it, let's pull the bike. Mm. So that frame was rusted in two halves in my backyard. Um, and we fixed the frame. And then a friend of mine came around because I wanted a front wheel with a disc brake. And he dropped that round and we had to modify a whole bunch of stuff to make it fit. And it all worked and we're about two weeks out from the event. It started and it went and it was like, mm -hmm. cool. Stick it on the trailer, get down there. I'd taken it for one test ride and came back and it was like, it should go. <laughs> Um, and it was freaking awesome. It was just really fun. Um, problem was the class that we were racing in, uh, we broke a lot of the class rules. So it was meant to be pre-63, and that is, but it's also no wheel or wheels, no disc brakes, uh, mm -hmm. no reed valve, um, no standard cylinders, blah, blah, and we, we broke every rule. <laughs> um, I like the sound of that. And it wasn't so bad. Initially, they said, oh, you can go out of that class. That's the slowest class. And in years gone by, other people had gone along and they were lapping maybe 20 seconds a lap slower than everyone else. Mm -hmm. We got there and we were tussling with people at the back of the, um, the grid. And we actually took points off people who were really serious racers. And, mm -hmm. and so it was like, oh, that's not cool. We'll, um, we probably won't go back again, you know. But it was fun to have done it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looked like a cool trip. Um, oh, it was. And that, once again, that was just a group of friends Mm. Went down to, um, to have a bit of a shared time, and yeah. Kind of gutted I couldn't go this year. Um, maybe next year I'll have to plan it better. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's worth, it's a bucket list event, you know, you've got yeah. to do it. Bad thing. Yeah. Uh, when did you come across the one? So the Indian... I said, I'd always wanted it, and I, we got to a point in our life where we finally had, you know, money was a little bit easier, the kids were a bit older, and it's quite a nice story, so uh, there's a friend of mine who passed away, this is him up here, top one Max William Christensen, you see uh -huh. that? Yeah. He got asbestos poisoning, oh, no. he was the nicest guy, and he, um, he was driving down my road one day, and I was walking the dog, and he stopped really fast. Hey, Max, how you doing, man? He goes, not well. I've just been told I've got three months to live. <laughs> and I'm just like, fuck, that's no good. He goes, I'm going to be the most upbeat, happiest, terminally ill person you've ever met. met. And I was just like, fuck, that's amazing. And he was. He actually lasted 15 months. But he took it upon himself. To anyone that he knew that he thought might get on, he'd just meet up. You know, So when you'd be here, and the car would come up the road, of the driveway, I should say, and a whole bunch of people would pull out. Hey man, this is Mark, this is Tim, this is Rex, you gotta meet these guys. It's like, oh, awesome. And the same thing, you'd get a call, come jump in the car, we're going to see such and such. And and it was amazing. And so one of the people I met was a guy who lives close to me, and he's been riding Indians for the last, well, since he's been riding bikes. Mm -hmm. And we got to, we got, got on really well, we chatting away, and I said to him, Man, if you ever come across a project, I couldn't afford to buy one completely finished, but um, I'd be real keen. About a month later, he calls me up and says, I'll buy one. I said, okay. Um, so he sent me, emailed me through a couple of photos. Um, <laughs> and it was a stream of pieces just lying along this path outside mm -hmm. someone's garden shed. And I, I said to him, is that good value? Is that worth buying? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, okay, cool, sold. So they turned up here. Um, and it was quite neat because a lot of the pieces were missing. So a lot of the pieces, it, because it's so far gone, you get really, you get artistic license mm -hmm. to do what you want. So things like the handlebars, couldn't find a set of handlebars, no one would sell them to me, so I made them. Um, it didn't have guards or fenders, whatever you want to call them. Uh -huh. um, and they were on eBay for 600 bucks out of India. But they landed in, oh, I've got to mount them how I wanted them. Um, the original, because it's a military bike, the, the guards were originally set really high, and there's massive clearance between the tyres and the fenders. And if you see oh. people who've restored them, 
Yeah, there's a couple on trade me at the moment, and you see this massive, they look hideous, yeah. big gap between it's the guards. Like a low rider, eh? Yeah, so I really, I basically got two um, sockets, mm-hmm. you know, socket set things, and stuck them on the tyres, and then sat the guard on top, mm-hmm. and then made all the struts so it sat where I wanted it to, you know. Um, the headlight, I couldn't find one for love nor money, so that's actually off an old English car. It came up for $10 on trade me. So, um, we put that on, I had to make all the mounts and everything for that. Um, and that was fun, like I say, it was three years mm. that I took to build it up. And um, along the way I met someone who, he was in an Indian club and he wanted to start his own sort of painting business. He was really good at it, but he was trying to get out, been in the same day job for a while, and he just said, oh, could I please paint this? I said, cool, let me know what you want. And so um, I paid him, obviously. But, um, yeah, so all of that social side of it, mm. you know, comes into play again. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. And it um, took me about six months to get the hang of riding it because the throttle's on the left-hand side, not mm. the right-hand side. Is it the internal thr- throttle? Yeah. Um, there's a foot clutch and a hand gear change. Mm. And, you know, I was really intimidated by it to start with. But after a while, um, you do, you get more comfortable and it becomes second nature, you know, like I had a car pull out in front of me yesterday when I was on it. And that thing to know, like, put on the clutch, knock into neutral and where all the brakes and stuff yeah. were, yeah. Before it's second nature. Yeah. Does it have, a, like, a specific um, sequence oh, to yes. start her up? Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, full choke, full throttle, give it a bunch of kicks so you're actually getting some gas inside the cylinders. Mm-hmm. And then you turn the key on take the choke off and it's usually one or two kicks and it just mm. roars into life it's quite beautiful when uh, this is where I kind of come unstuck sometimes and I'm so damn stubborn that uh, when I have a, when I had my red bike I wanted to hear it so I kicked it maybe 150 times <laughs> and uh, in such an effort that my kneecaps were so blue because <laughs> my right kneecap would hit an oil tank and my left <laughs> kneecap would hit a battery box <laughs> and I would just kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it, and I was just so freaking stubborn, I'll get you going. And um, then when you take it away, you strip it down, retime it, and she starts up on a first kick. And you, can, and you kind of like, dude, she'll start in a kick or two or whatever, but uh, if it doesn't go, something's wrong. Don't just keep kicking it and ruining us all that way. My problem uh, is I live at the top of a hill. Mm. So it doesn't start, oh, I'll just crash start it down the hill. Mm. And then it doesn't start. So my driveway is really steep, but then there's a road which is about a kilometre long and it's quite gradual. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> the worst is you'll crash, try and crash it down the driveway. It'll give a couple of coughs, like, oh, it might start. And then you get to the bottom and then you go, oh, I'll just keep going down the road. It should start. And next thing you know, you're like a kilometre and a half away from home, sitting there with a bike that doesn't go, you know. And they're not super comfortable to push them, are they? Oh, no, no, no. No, you just leave it there and walk home and get the trailer. Because <laughs> yeah. I try to, when I got the flat tire, I tried to push the thing up a little s- hill. And with a flat tire, I, there was no way I had to put in the first gear and, uh, oh, yep, and yep. just walk by it. And uh, everything got completely derailed. I totally broke the beads off and things. But uh, man, it's just uncomfortable mm. and heavy. Man. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so and I learned a long time ago, yeah, if it doesn't start in the workshop, there'll be a reason. Yeah. Just stop and try and find out. Come, cool. I know. Uh, this is Mike. This is my first interview. Hopefully, you guys like it. But and we're gonna go for a ride. Yeah, I hope so. Let's go for a ride. Yeah, and I'm can't wait to see the Indian start. And um, yeah, let's do this. See you on the road. So you crack the throttle, wide open. Put the choke. Oh, that's another good thing. You know, throttle. There's no return spring. Oh no! It stays wherever it is. Cru- oh, early cruise control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, full throttle, um, choke on and no key. Let's give it a few kicks to get some um, juice into it. Retard the spark a little bit. Let's see how we go. Oh, 
how cool is that? Grab your helmet and take off. little end of the ride. Thank you Mike for hanging around. That was fun man. Yeah. Thanks well, for coming to see me. Yeah, that was a total pleasure. And it's nice to see the bike on the road and in flesh doing the bikey things. So um well till next time you should check out Mike's channel. He's mainly on a Facebook but he has uh, some stuff on the YouTube and maybe we'll make him more do yeah, YouTube yeah, stuff. Yeah, so yeah. Um, uh, not a motor motorcycle shop on a YouTube See you next time. See ya. So that was Mike from uh, Not a Motorcycle Shop. He's a very cool individual, really cool guy. It was a total pleasure hanging with him and see his uh, lovely Indian he built. You know, people like this are definitely an inspiration. Who just uh, put their mind to it, get some old projects, build it, and they ride it and enjoy it. And they enjoy the experience they get from riding these old motorcycles. You don't have to be fast, but every sense of you has to be tuned to the machine with a clutch, with a throttle, changing gears, everything's different. Everything is quite clunky and chunky and uh, sensual. It's, it's just an experience. It's just like these iron heads. Well, for me anyway, you know, you change a gear, it's just clunks and Everything is raw and beautiful and uh, I guess that's why I love these old bikes because they just total immersion into riding a motorcycle. Nothing like that compares from riding a newer bike, at least in my head anyway. But obviously I am not the only one who thinks that. So uh, yeah, that was the interview done. 
hopefully you guys like it and uh, now it's time to journey home uh, day is looking beautiful so uh, let's just enjoy this little piece see you at home my first interview is over um, hopefully you liked it uh, thank you Mike uh, for your time and uh, hopefully this is a um, start of many more interviews with uh, really cool people in New Zealand so um, yeah feel free to uh, do what's necessary to keep me going I'll press all the buttons you need to and uh, I can appreciate it and I will see you next time take care and here is a little PS. Uh, if you know of anyone who is real interesting, who builds bikes and, uh, I don't know, been riding motorcycles for eons, let me know. Write it down in a comment where they are and if they are anywhere near-ish. Um, oh, I'm happy to travel. I'd be happy to uh, uh, come and over and have a chat to them as long as they are not shy. Well, I am shy, but I'm doing it anyway. But um, uh, I try to appear not to be shy. But um, yeah, it would be cool to uh, spread the web and uh, see who's out there and um, who we can uh, chat to and um, share the love for motorcycles and building them and uh, the troubles and history and everything that comes with it. That would be um, appreciated. Let me know.